Hi, everybody. This is Kat Nip on Thursday, April 30th, 2020, with our podcast for Press Reset World. It was started with the idea that the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown can be a great time to reimagine our world and what we needed to do. Today, I am virtually joined by Margaret Page. Margaret is the current first VP of Toastmasters International. She's an entrepreneur and keynote speaker, coaching others about business etiquette, and coaching women who want to run for political office. Uh, welcome, Margaret. It's a delight to be here, Kat. I, I have to tell you that it was maybe 10 plus years ago I met you in Toastmasters, and uh, you said, I'm, I want to encourage women to get into politics. And I always wanted to interview you from that time. <laughs> I thought, i got to get back to this woman at some point. It's taken this long to talk about that subject, because I, I can't remember the details, but we were both like excited about that idea. So tell me why you think that it's important that women get into politics and leadership roles. Certainly. So, you know, the leadership roles and positions need to look like those they lead. And so if the population is made up 53% women, 51% women, well, then those in leadership need to look and reflect that so that they can make decisions based on the people that they serve. And uh, for a long time, that has not been the case. But also the other thing is the model of politics that we have today is not really designed by women for women. You know, mm. it's a very controversial environment. It's a very antagonistic environment. And that's not the way women go about solving problems. We're very collaborative and yeah. uh, work on finding solutions together. So the model is not a good fit for women, but how do we make it a good fit for women so they can get in there and then begin to change it? And, and how do you talk about that? How do, you, how do you think we should make it a better fit? Is there certain things we can do? Well, certainly is to encourage more women to run, to support more women to run, and uh, certainly to educate young women and have that desire to want to serve and understand that they can make a difference in the world. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you find that young women are getting interested? You know, young women nowadays have different interests than, than my generation. Women, young women, or at least many of them that I'm coming across, really want to make a mark in a different way about doing something unique, inventing something unique, some innovation, or stretching their experiences, climb mountains, and, uh, and push their bodies so that they can do extraordinary things, break records, and just find the limits of who they are, not necessarily in, in politics, but they're just stretching boundaries everywhere of okay. creating and, and being. So, uh, yeah, I find that um, uh, I think women hesitate to go into a public arena that is, let's face it, very male dominated and, and, um, and designed for men. I, you know, that's their competitive world. And so they shy away. So what do you what do you say to encourage women to jump in there, first of all? And do you think that we can change that system from within once we have a majority of women in there? Or tell me tell me what your thoughts are on that. I think we can change it. You know, look at New Zealand and their prime minister and the things that she's done yeah. in with other countries where we have women leaders. I think it does take to be inside and but you have to get there. And yeah. so you know, you, you have to go the route of getting in there. But once in there, they, they can make a difference. But there has to be that desire. You have to have a big enough why. You have to have, um, you know, that, uh, that that's, that's your sort of uh, slice of the pie that you're going to make a difference in the world as opposed to how you might in some other avenue. Do you find that's what, how women get in? There's one thing that they are interested in changing, and so that's how they get in? What's your experience? Well, usually people have had some sort of crisis in their life. There's mm. 
extenuating circumstances that creates that pivot that says, you know, I, I want to make a difference here. So generally something happened, uh, could have been to a child, could have been to a parent, could have been the frustration with the school board, whatever the case may be, there was some frustration that was a driving factor and got them to Hmm, I want to fix this in some way, which I think is always the starting point of good leadership is seeing something that's not working and then be able to, and willing to, to create the change there. I remember Sarah Waddington was in Vancouver one time. She's the woman that uh, fought the Wade versus Roe. The uh -huh. lawyer did that. And uh, she said uh, leadership, and I liked her definition and have adopted it since, is she said leadership is looking out into your communities, your organizations, and your families and see what's not working and being willing to make a change there. And she said, leave your thumbprint on that because it's not enough just to support, I'll help behind the scenes of that, I'll help behind the scenes, but I won't take responsibility. So it's really about taking responsibility of the change. So what you're advocating for, I will take responsibility if it doesn't work. Right. Not hiding behind um, and, and allowing others to be the face of, but I'm just there supporting and nurturing. That's not enough. You have yeah. to be willing to take responsibility. That I mean, it, I mean, this is kind of age old now, but the strong woman behind the man kind of thing is a, a thing of the past. I think we're now the strong women are now in the front. But um, what do you do when you find um, that? especially in a, in a Toastmasters, which is a communications and leadership organization and public speaking. So dovetails very nicely with politics. Mm -hmm. um, what, do, what do you find that they, uh, you have to do to coach them to help them be better speakers, be better leaders? What are the, some of the things that they're going to need to know to, uh, to win in that environment? Sure. So of, there's, there's many things, but first of all, it's narrowing it down to the why, you know, to make a difference isn't enough. Everyone wants to make a difference, but you have to know specifically how you want to make a difference and then have the confidence and strength to go over the, to go after that. Find the words to express that, but it's really about specificity about the changes that you believe in and want to create and then helping them have the confidence and support. There was some research done oh, probably decades ago by former transport minister, Judy Reed, not Linda Reed, but Judy Reed. And, and at that time it was about when, you know, a man will make up one morning and say, I, I'm going to run for political office. Whereas a woman will say, you know, she wants to hear it from others. We want to hear that others believe that we are good enough or mm. have the skills and ability. And if we hear it frequently enough, then we will step out. Now, there's some interpretations of that data. Some interpret that, that we make more informed decisions. We want to, to know more about it before we make that decisions. And then there's a camp that says uh, women are lacking the confidence. And I, I suspect it's a little of both that we do take longer to make informed decisions, but also we need the boost in confidence. We want the boost in confidence in order to step forward with a little more strength. I don't think it's a bad thing that we take more time to make decisions to you. No, wow, I think that's, that's a good thing. That's yeah, a good thing. And that I, serves I, us well in small business as well. You know, in small business, women pay their loans off quicker and, and are better. Uh, yeah. We don't go buy toys and trinkets, to, you know, cars and bikes and planes and boats. We pay off our loans. So we're good. We're good entrepreneurs that way. Yeah, I, I've always thought that the, our responsibility, but at the same time, I, uh, um, I noticed, I mean, this is going to be a funny little uh, metaphor maybe, but watching The Simpsons, and I, I don't know if you remember The Simpsons, and, uh, and Marge Simpson and Lisa Simpsons, Simpson, they're the responsible ones. And then it's Homer and Bart that are irresponsible. And I always think, oh, well, that's interesting how we're always cast in the role of being responsible, <laughs> the responsible ones, and yet we're not in leadership. And it's kind of ironic that 
uh, that seems to be how we're thought of, and yet we're not given this this uh, place of responsibility. And uh, so I think that's part of what could change if we have more women in leadership uh, roles. But tell me about your leadership role, because you're now uh, first vice president of Toastmasters International. And I, I'm, I'm fine if you want to go on about a little bit about uh, what Toastmasters does for leaders. Um, but tell me about your climbing up the ranks in Toastmasters and, uh, and your leadership roles personally. Certainly. So Toastmasters is an organization that teaches communication and leadership skills through a self-paced process. And so you grow as quickly and fast as you want. And the two pillars of success for the organization that's been around since 1924 have been evaluations and mentorship. And so I think these are the two attributes or two areas that where women grow the fastest is by getting uh, feedback on how they can improve and also finding that mentorship, that person to discuss things through, that person to test out ideas with and, and to support you in your growth. So my journey in Toastmasters, I joined Toastmasters thinking it would be very much like a course in university. It would be a six month program and I it was once and done and I would be out the door. And I realized I came to Toastmasters to, to be a better communicator or and everyone comes to be better at something. And then you realize, well, to be good at something, you need to continue on your journey and continue to polish. And then if you want to step into the best version of yourself, then you need to continue to, to work on it all the time. And the magic of Toastmasters is it is a, an affordable arena to help you step into your best self. You know, each and every week you get the support from fellow members and it's that piece of always polishing, looking out and evaluating, oh, I like that, I want to ad adopt that in my personality or I want to polish that in that regard. So it's constantly, because it's consistent on a weekly basis, that you're consistently evaluating yourself and bringing in new information and data. So, um, and, and it actually gives you a, um, a pathway. Um, you're actually, as first VP of Toastmasters, one day it's very highly possible that you will be the president of Toastmasters International. Um, yeah. And that's 141 countries, I think. Um, 143 countries. I 143 believe. countries. There we go. And um, so, so uh, what have you learned? you know, going up that pathway of leadership? What are some of the things you say, okay, I know something about leadership now that I didn't know before. I, I decided to plunge right in. Yes. Well, what I learned about leadership, the distinction for me, which was so incredibly valuable, I had been an entrepreneur for more than 25 years, maybe 30 years since I joined uh, Toastmasters, so had lots of leadership experience. But in the entrepreneurial world, for me at least, it was more results. And I always think leadership is about two things. It's about results and relationships. Mm -hmm. And results happen to be the, the priority for a long time because you're an entrepreneur. And as we've discussed, you need to, you know, pay off your loans, make sure, you know, everything gets done and hold people accountable, et cetera, et cetera. So it was more on the results to survive. And since I started my Toastmaster journey, and I think any not for profit, it really heightens the relationships and mm. how, my, how much more important people are. And I think particularly in this time of crisis, you know, there's, there's three things that any organization needs to do. And that's, first of all, take care of their people and uh, protect their financial assets and uh, do good in the world. So how can we do all three? But definitely it's taking care of your people people mm. first. And that's my greatest learning from Toastmasters 
also my experience as when I was the district governor of all of British Columbia, I learned the value of teamwork. I, I thought I knew what teamwork was because mm -hmm. I had led teams for years and years and years. And I thought um, the team was going well. And it wasn't until May of my term as a 12 month term for leadership that I felt a distinct shift where we actually were working as a team. Mm -hmm. And it was palpable, the difference. So there's a difference between not getting along and then just getting along and then really working as a team. Mm -hmm. And that was magical. Uh, I would do that in, again in a heartbeat. It wasn't about ultimately the results we achieved, which were fabulous. But what was magical was that we came together as a team, and that was an incredible experience. And so what, what, um, what made it go from just normal to that? What was it? Well, I, I liken it to, first of all, we came up with a single goal. This is what everyone needs to do, but everyone benefited from that goal. It was simple and people benefited, but people also became interested. I'm as interested in your growth as I am my own. Mm. So let me support you, let me help you, and we're in this together. So it was that kind of mentality of keeping it simple, particularly in a volunteer organization. I think we get too complex because we compare the um, for-profit world and, and elaborate you know, strategies and tactics and, and everything, and then we make it too complex. But bring it down to the simple, because volunteers don't have 40 hours a week or 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, and make sure it's understood by everyone. They all benefit. Everyone benefits from the outcome. Mm -hmm. And then people are eager and excited to support each other in their growth. Yeah, you you mentioned um, the uh, Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand, and um, is is there a role model, a female role model, either in the past or currently, who who is somebody who you admire as far as a leader goes, a female leader goes that you can? I've always to? admired Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm. You know, and. Um, I, well, I think we have a lot of female leaders to look back on and admire, you know, yeah. each for different reasons. And, and certainly we have Oprah that's, uh, you know, and yeah. a lot of, I, I, you know, if you, if you search in business, the most articles written in business is on leadership. Yeah. And so we have so much variety in our leadership. And uh, I think all of us, uh, step up in different ways. So we can't just define one type of leadership. One time I was right. asked, asked the question, the difference, you know, if Winston Churchill was put in Mother Teresa's position and oh, Mother yeah. Teresa was put in Winston <laughs> Churchill's, would they be the same leader with this, the same outcome? Probably not. No. So, so it's the context that you, that surround your world and what doors you're willing to open and and do good in there and so right. each one will be provided a different situation and your leadership will be different based on on the scenario that's put in front of you the problems you have to solve yeah i your uh, scenario there of mother Teresa and winston churchill are 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 men and women inherently different in how they lead? You mentioned relationship is very important. And I, I think, God, that's not something I hear men talk about in a big way. I, I hear women talk about relationship a lot more in a big way. Is, is that one of the inherent differences between male and female leadership, do you think? or? Well, if you look at Simon Sinek, that's all he's been talking about oh. for for a number of years. So I think there has been a shift. There, there has been a shift because of the women that stepped up, you know, in the last 15 to 20 years and the number of women that are getting educated in different fields and arena and the women that are raising their hands and saying, I want to make a difference. But there are also men that are stepping up to that. And I would say Simon Sevenick is a really good example of a male leader who is different 
than mm -hmm. other male leaders, and he, and he is making a huge difference. Yeah. And, and there's others. There's yeah. others as well. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I've, um, I talk to my husband a lot about this, actually, is um, the big thing we see as damaging of male leadership, and I think is different than female leadership, is um, men can be accused of having, uh, in leadership, of having a larger ego than, than women. And that usually gets in the way. And uh, so we, we kind of, every time we, he's a, a student of history and uh, has a degree in that. So he's always, we're always seeing points in history where it was like, hmm, gee, that could have been avoided if uh, so-and-so's ego wasn't in the way. Mm -hmm. And um, do you find that too, that women are a lot more humble and that helps in their leadership or maybe it hinders because they're not as competitive enough? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. But I, I think there are women today that are leading like men. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's not as authentic. And then there's women out there that aren't expressing an opinion. They are, you know, I've, I've seen them do speeches on things and, and they're just, it's content, but they're not right. expressing an opinion of... of um, they're playing how, it safe, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The the idea of authenticity is that something you coach people about or talk about? Absolutely. I mean, who who isn't coaching and teaching to that now? Yeah. I I think the world because we've shifted so much from our entertainment being on television where it, where perfection was expected, and now we're in YouTube, social media, and Zoom. You know, people are inviting people into their homes, and so there's there is a demand for authenticity. TED Talks, the same thing. It's there is this demand for authenticity, and if you're not stepping into that, being authentic with who you are, um, I think you miss the times. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's interesting at this time now that a, a lot of talk shows and everything have gone into people's homes and everything, and we're seeing all these celebrities and different people in their own natural habitat, dare I say. And I think that's, that, that helps the authenticity uh, to a certain extent. And I don't know if that's going to have a big influence in the future once we come out of this or not. Um, are we going to want to break down those barriers and be less formal or um, and what might happen to our I leadership. Think already, I think we're already there. I think we broke down, broke down the barriers yeah. of formality. And uh, so what's next really what's next. And, and what um, is next? What, what do you think is next? Uh, I, I think we'll continue to, to grow as this is definitely kind of the pivot point and we are uh, at, at a, I think I read um, in Arianna Huffington's uh, Thrival magazine about a portal to a new world and I think we're there. I think we will um, embrace different things and right now we have people that will be afraid of coming back out after COVID settles down mm. that will want to continue to protect themselves and then there's the group that is so anxious to to get out and uh, if you want to identify them as introverts and extrovert, extroverts maybe so but essentially the bell curve is flattening more those that need uh, more interaction with people will be pushing out and yeah. those that are not will be wanting to remain at home and more comfortable and more safe so the, um, the bell curve is flattening or extending out our areas. And we'll have to accommodate that, that, um, that we're not all bunched up in the same um, sort of life we were before. Yeah, yeah. It's important to say, okay, let's make a change. It's an opportunity. But um, so is there some, some organization, I'm going to go into this um, uh, question right now that I ask everybody is there an organization that you would like them to support or to help the world make a better place and uh, what would you say that organization is yeah well uh, I say support and encourage Toastmasters International because it helps people find their voice no matter what your economic background or your gender or or 
race, whatever it is, help people find their voice so they can make a difference in the communities that they work for. And, uh, and that's a good thing. I know, because you and I have both seen people in that organization just thrive and just come out of their shell in a way that they never would in any other organization. So, transforms so. people's lives. I can't tell you the stories around the world I've heard, you know, that were people that were on the verge of, of, of so many tragedies and so much and, and lifesavers for them. And now, because we're online, we become a safe haven for people. People sharing their stories, people mm. sharing their worry, anxiety because of COVID and having a place to meet and connect because what many are lacking now is connection and we're filling that void. So, right. so is, there, is there a success story in Toastmasters that you think of right away? Like a one person success? Yeah, yeah. You don't yeah. mention their name. Yeah, there is. Uh, I, it, in, the, the one that always pops in my mind was the woman that said to me that she was on the verge of suicide. Her, uh -huh. her child, she had a, a baby that uh, had crib death. Oh. And she said she struggled for about six months and she was just on the verge of, she just could not live without the child and felt that it was, you know, she could have done something and was blaming herself. And someone dragged her to a Toastmaster meeting and there was just a glimmer of light. And then there, and then the light got bigger and bigger and bigger. And she said it's virtually saved her life. And to me that, because I'm a woman and a mother and I, you know, for to lose a child like that and that we were able to give her something to look forward to and help support her. So, and we're not a, 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 a psychological, you know, no, or no therapy group no. or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. We're not a counseling group, but if we are an arena for people to learn and grow and, and that's what people do and her ability. And we all seek progress in our life in some way or mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, pathways or Toastmasters guide you to that growth of yourself. So. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've uh, watched Brene Brown, Brown's uh, vulnerability yes. talks and, and, uh, or any of her books or anything like that. But I think that is also um, what you just said reminded me that I think that's another aspect of women in leadership in uh, they're more likely to be vulnerable uh, to to show their vulnerability and um and that's maybe something we need in the world well i have to tell you i, I know you're almost wrapping up but i think this is an important topic so i in the last few years i've actually shed tears in front of audiences i had never you know for probably 20 years in my life i was you know just not I, it just didn't happen. Yeah. There was nothing to shed tears about. But I have shed tears in front of audience. And the first couple of times I beat myself up and I thought, oh, why, you know, oh, why yeah. did you do that? Why did that happen? And so I actually took it to an audience and I said, how do you feel about women that, you know, do you see them as lesser or do you wish they hadn't of or how do you see them? And it's interesting that young people really see that as a sign of un and anyone that was under 30 just mm -hmm. applauded and bravo and uh, anyone over that age group was, yeah, it's okay. Um, no one dissed it. No one said, oh, that, you know, because I, I, I don't think you can in this day and age, but being vulnerable that way. But it was very fascinating how, mm. how it, it was actually appealing to young people. Now, I don't encourage anyone to go out and get tearful in front of an audience just to get appeal. Yeah, but there yeah. is different thoughts about uh, about that expressing that level of emotion in front of an audience yes and you know what i had a mentor who uh, made us uh, go and watch courage under fire um, which is meg ryan and uh and she is an officer in a combat situation mm -hmm. and at, at one point in there uh spoiler alert on this one she she cries in front of the men right? And they, some of them start rousing her and she just turns on them and says, I'm just releasing. That's all I'm doing. And, um, 
and there's actually, I think, scientific studies on, on that, that it actually reduces, when women cry, that it actually reduces their stress and possibly why, why men feel more stress um, is because they don't have that release. And so, yeah, we, it's, it's interesting that gen, the uh, age difference breakdown when you did that little, little survey that we're maybe changing and looking at leadership different and bringing in this Brene Brown uh, yeah. idea that vulnerability is a good thing. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that can be, uh, that is probably where we need to go in leadership because as I mentioned before on the ego thing, I think the ego, when I talk about ego, it's not like ego is evil, but, um, but if it, it blocks people from, uh, you know, and, not thinking about others and just thinking about what they want to accomplish. I think that's the opposite of vulnerable, right? It's to me, yeah. it's, it's not, it's somebody who's always being defensive and trying to look out for how they look in public. And I'm thinking of one particular leader <laughs> right now, but uh, I'm not going to mention because I don't do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't give anybody. I mean, yes, the, 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 the gentleman that uh, is the leader of the, of, uh, of the largest economy in the world, maybe. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, that I, I one. Should, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I don't want to give him any more uh, uh, airtime than he too much. He takes up too much air, as it is. So um, yeah. So I, I, and, and when I, you, uh, when you said, oh well, um, you know, you're wrapping up. It's like I never wrap up when we're in the middle of something that's interesting. So don't feel like you have to. And but. Given that, I think we've had a very uh, interesting conversation, and I do have one, a uh, couple other little questions I want to ask you. And one is, I did ask you uh, this so you could be prepared. Is there one thing you would like people to do in COVID nineteen in their daily lives that you think would help them make the world a better place? So, that, so it's not thinking big and out there in the world, but something that we can all do. Small steps. Small steps. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the biggest things in coaching are supported more people. Oprah said, uh, think of three things you're grateful for and jog them down every day. And uh, so I've done what I called maximizing that and three, uh, and I have people give, send two compliments to two people each and every day. And it's unique compliments. It's um, so it can't be complimenting someone for something they already know or heard. Yeah. And so it's each and every day thinking about that. And mm -hmm. then um, for years, I send one thank you card. And that was not my original first idea. I had heard it from Pamela Goldsmith Jones. And, uh, and, and it turns out that many other leaders do as well, is send one note of gratitude. So it's really those three great things. Oprah's model was three things I am grateful for in my life. So just cataloging that. But yeah. two things, two compliments to people. Mm -hmm. Send an email out, unique because it helps you sharpen who you want to become as well, but also lifts them up and supports them. And then one note of gratitude. So I call it the three, two, one of maximizing. Oh. Your so very specific, kind very of specific. specific. Okay. Well, then I can give you a very specific compliment in that I admire you and uh, I love, look up to you as a, a leader and, Obviously, I hold on to that for like 10 years of wanting to interview you. <laughs> so oh, so, you. so that's, what I, that's, that's what I want to give to you if that's a compliment. There it is. Well, um, and I've really enjoyed talking to you. And thanks for coming to Press Reset World podcast. And uh, to our listeners, uh, please give us your comments and tell your friends to subscribe on PressResetWorld.com or our YouTube channel, which is PRW. And a link should be at the end of the pod post on Press Reset World. Um, perhaps you would make an excellent guest or have an article to submit on our blog. Uh, we want your opinion, your expertise, perhaps, or but mostly your opinion. So contact us. So to me, many man, minds, many minds make deeper wisdom, and uh, that's what I'm I'm standing up for. So I want to thank you again, Margaret Page at margaretpage.com is where you will find her if you want to know more about Margaret. Keep doing the great work, Margaret. Thank you, and you too, Kat. Bye. Bye now. Bye now.